Wish you were one of those influencers with raving fans who binge on your every word, consume all your content, buy everything you have to sell, and demand even more? Then stay tuned while Authority Magazine columnist and BuzzFeed contributor Tracy Hazard shares strategies, tips, and tactics from top videocasters, podcasters, authors, and social influencers on creating that bingeable factor. Now, let's join Tracy as she explores how to rise above all the digital noise with The Binge Factor. Sometimes podcasters leave such an impression on you. Annie P. Ruggles, my guest today on The Binge Factor, is one of those people. She has just left such an impression. Too Legitimate to Quit is the name of our podcast, which I absolutely love. For over a decade, Annie P. has harnessed her Hulk-like disdain for hard sales, tacky self-promotion, and overly competitive sleazeballs as inspiration to help people find better ways to grow their small business. As founder of the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy, she's guided hundreds of people toward making deeper connections, lasting impressions, and friendlier, more lucrative transactions and conversations. Hence her podcast. Her pride and joy is her podcast, Too Legitimate to Quit, Instantly Actionable Small Business Strategies with a Pop Culture Spin. I had so much fun. Annie and I are both 80s girls, so we had a lot of fun chatting about all of these things um, and her pop culture spin. So it was just the mo- one of the most enjoyable podcasts I've had in the last few months, and I cannot rave about her show enough. So you're going to have to listen to this interview with Annie P. Ruggles, Too Legitimate to Quit. Annie, thanks so much for joining me. Too Legitimate to Quit. I love the title of the show. Was that your first title or did you go that through a few was iterations? That my first title. I, uh, I always overthink the titles of everything. It's one of my weird quirks or kinks or I don't know what. But, you know, I was walking around and I had Too Legit too legit to quit stuck in my head and I was like yeah I'll just call it too legit to quit I'm like no that's somebody else's IP like how do I make it businessy and I actually said to myself like you know I should call it something like too legitimate to quit and then proceeded to brainstorm for an additional you know month until finally I was like oh yeah that offhanded thing you said at the beginning of the brainstorming could have saved a month of your life Let's just roll with yeah, that. Yeah, we're, we're often right with our instincts. And, right? You know. oh, but I was like, oh, I could call it this or I could call it this or I could. And it was always like it went from clear to clever to crazy to cutesy. Like it ran the gamut of all these naming styles. And I was like, you know, you could just add like five letters and then make it a totally different title plus an homage. Why don't you just... Do that. do that. Yeah. Well, it's great. It's a wonderful title. I love the energy that it sets too. You know, it's just setting that tone for what your show is going to be about. But what made you start a podcast? Do you even getting to that point where you're like coming up with cool titles? You know, it's interesting, the evolution of how this show came to be. I never really considered podcasting, which is hysterical because I was a voracious podcast listener. So I was listening to podcasts about freaking everything, history, psychology, not a lot of business. And I think because I wasn't listening to a lot of other business podcasts, it didn't really occur to me to have a business podcast of my own. And yet, Everyone around you, if you're in anything close to business or personal development, you are bombarded a hundred bajillion times a day to get your content out there and make sure your content is really uniquely yours. You need content, you need content, you need content, you need video, you need video, you need video, you need all these things. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do a video. And I am blessed and cursed with obsessive compulsive disorder. So when I fixate, I fixate. And I got really hooked on this idea of what if I could teach sales communications through the lens of the golden girls, (laughs) how each of the golden girls would have a different selling style or a different selling strength. And so that kind of started the snowball rolling of like, oh, 
And then after I do that, I could talk about lessons from Columbo. If y'all can't tell I'm an 80s baby, you know, the references are not going to stop. <laughs> They're right? used but, to it from me because I right? am too. So, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I'm like, oh, what about Columbo? Oh, what about this? Oh, what about this? And I kept writing instead of making video or audio. And I was like, what is this? why i know i'm i'm trying to figure out what this is it's starting to feel really flat and one-sided i have vast experience within my lane of experience but my lane of experience is very narrow right so number one number two i have vast deep love for pop culture that happened between 1986 and 1996 you know what i mean like it's very broad but very slim and so <laughs> i started thinking about what if I could have conversations with people instead? What if I could bring other people into this joy? And what if I could bring some of the names that are stuck being so serious all the time because they're considered experts in this very serious thing that is online business and marketing and sales. What if I could empower them to have a little fun with their content and look at things differently? And I thought, you know, a lot of people are still not super comfortable on video. Why don't I just take the resistance out of it one step further just have an audio only interview only pop culture small business podcast and so that's how it came to be i love it i love it i love it so normally i you know go a little bit further into the episode and talk about their binge factor but here i'm gonna do it right now because you kind of hit it right on it is that you know when i had listened to your show i know you're a listener like there's a distinct difference. This is, I tell the audience this, I can tell the difference between a podcast host that's a listener and yep. one that's not. Annie Ruggles is clearly a listener. Like there's no oh, question about yeah. that. Yeah. And it's, it translates into the fact that this is a sales communication business development show disguised as an energetic gossip show. Like, that's how it feels to me. I feel like it's it's Gilmore Girls for business or that's something it. like it's, that, right? It has been called the TMZ of business podcasting. And yeah. uh, my at first, I wanted to, like, bristle against that and be like, ew, TMZ is so trashy. And I'm like, no, TMZ is consumably bingeable to the point that you don't realize how much you're actually taking in until you look and you go, did I really just browse that site for 35 minutes? Great. Let me be that podcast. Learn while you have fun. I love it. That's right. Uh, you should just take that as, as a total compliment and go yeah. from there, right? Oh, because yeah. you know what? We have to learn in whatever formats we're comfortable in. Yeah. And sometimes we need that nudge to kind of force us to learn these things that are so important to us. And if we're willing to go <laughs> and have fun and chat and listen to the talk show style and then get some takeaways at the end that we apply, great. Good for you and good for us. And what I my dream for the show is not just to put out individual episodes that are fun and actionable although obviously that's the day-to-day week-to-week delivery of my show but i love hearing from listeners and guests on the show that one thing that they enjoy is the application of one of my mottos which is that inspiration's freaking everywhere right and so what i've heard from people including my guests and including my listeners. And even the way that I do it myself is somebody will be watching something on Netflix at two o'clock in the morning when they can't sleep. And then they'll go, oh, you know what? That would make really good copywriting. See what he did that, that there's really good. It's two o'clock in the morning. They're binging Netflix. And now they're like, okay, hold on. Action item for my business. Make sure my next email includes this point. Whoa, excellent. I'm so delighted you're finding out that the world is unlimited free marketing and sales resources packaged as entertainment. Get after it, y'all. Fantastic. That's what I want is I want people to have fun and I want people to have that filter that they can see what repels them and what attracts them is all around us. It's not just in traditional advertising and it's not just in somebody's webinar. Well, you know, and this is something that I think about a lot, that there is this success factor that I see from, 
the people who are able to synthesize what's going on from a trend development standpoint, from mm -hmm. a consumer culture, like when you understand intimately how people buy or how people consume, yeah. you do a better job. I mean, that's what we're doing here on The Binge Factor. We're talking about how people are consuming podcasts and what that translates into the consumption of your products, your services, your, your coaching, your business, right? Yep. And how you make those two things tie together. And you already have that skill and now you're almost in a meta way exposing it, right? Like you're yeah. talking about these things that are inspiring you, these things that are like tie-ins that seem, you know, maybe not as logical, but in your brain, you're sharing those connection points. Yep. And I think that kind of frees your listeners to do the same thing. And that's important because when we sit back and we treat our business like, it's, it's a pedantic lesson in this is the process and we reduce it down to that. No one takes it in at the end of the day mm -mm. because it's too structured. It doesn't fit my brain. And I, I let it go. I lose it. This is why people don't finish courses. They don't read through the our whole book, brains right? Our freaking tired, y'all. <laughs> our brains are oversaturated sponges that we keep pouring more and more into. And if you're an online marketer or you're running an online business, part of your job is to try to cram your bits and bobs into somebody else's already leaking sponge. Right. But additionally, like, I think that you're just, this is the point of like you being a podcast listener makes this mm -hmm. makes the difference right here is the fact that those of us who say, oh yeah, I'm in social media, but I'm not on Twitter or I'm not on Facebook or I don't ever oh. go on my, like that drives me crazy. You cannot be a good expert in this. If you're not do you're not in it and consuming it yourself. Right. And so one thing I said at the beginning was that when I first went into my podcast journey, I wasn't listening to any business podcasts. Now, approaching episode 100, I have not only interviewed some of the most brilliant business podcasters in the world, I have subscribed and binged their shows and listening to their marketing and sales shows not only make my show better, they make my business better. They live up to their promise, right? And so, not that you can only find inspiration for your business or for your show from other shows on park or on podcasting or marketing of course you can find it from you know ghost hunters and sasquatch and all the weird stuff i listen to but you know i think i was afraid to see what else was in my lane because i didn't want it to get tainted and and or my vision to get tainted or i didn't want to get jealous or competitive and instead i find the wealth of podcasts available to be completely inspiring on a multi-time a day basis i think you're so right like that's you know I, look here for the binge factor my job is to go listen to your show right, right? and I, so i listen to your show and i can tell you that there's this like Oh, I have two interviews today. I'm like, I'm going to have to listen to six <laughs> episodes because that's how I do it. Right. I got six <laughs> episodes. So the day before, like, I'm like, okay, are they going to be like good? Or are they going to be like, I just don't know. And then yours, like, I'm like, I love the show. Like it happens to me more <laughs> often than I expect. Yeah. That, that I end up loving it, that I learn something that it's like new input into it. And now I may not have the time to fully binge that show, but I've spot binged it enough to know, like, there's something really great going on here and I'm mm -hmm. learning something and taking input in. So yeah, I agree with you. I think, I think we, we get a little caught up. It's why I've, I'm not, I've not written a book. Like yeah. I'm a voracious reader and because of it, my book is still sitting on my shelf and not published because mm -hmm. I got myself into paralysis. So it can happen. Oh, yeah. It can also inspire. I didn't make my audiograms for like three weeks. And it wasn't even an act of like active re resistance. I just straight up forgot <laughs> until my wonderful, beautiful, loving assistant whose job it is to send these out to my guests and to babysit me in general was like, hello, you forgot. the spreadsheet <laughs> is empty. And I went and I was like, oh, I guess I didn't fill in the spreadsheet. And then I went in headliner and I was like, oh, 
I guess I never made the audiograms. Okay, well, I'll add next week. Oh, I'm like, oh, I went downstairs. I said to my husband, I'm like, I might be a little burnt out. <laughs> might be a little burnt out considering I, I just totally didn't do the thing that was such a part of my routine, right? And that happens all the more reason to go out, seek inspiration from other podcasts, meet other podcasters, showcase other brains with your own message. If you have a you only show or you want to do a you only show, listen, that is your prerogative. And I'm certainly not trying to say that you are not interesting enough to have your own solo show. I'm sure you are. However, nothing reignites that love and feeling in me and nothing gets me excited to share my show week after week after week than introducing my listeners to the magnificent brains that come on and gab with me it is such a joy and it still showcases me people say well wait a minute are you going to be able to make any money if you're always promoting these other people well yeah somebody's got to ask them questions somebody's got to interject in between them like you so lovingly said it sounds like a gossip show i'm yeah. all over it some episodes i talk more than they do and then i look at the transcript and i go gee annie shut up a little you know but <laughs> well you know what like that was one of the first things i said I, I as i was listening to your very the very first episode i picked which was which is your most recent one right and so mm -hmm. that's my process i go to the most recent go to your first and go in the middle yeah and so um and i was like wow there's a lot of her in it but it's working and mm -hmm. that's not i think it's a fine line mm -hmm. and it works because you have such a energetic personality that is just like off the chart that I like mm -hmm. it, it's infectious. And I think that's why that works for you. It might not work for everyone. And so I really oh, do want people to be cautious of that. No, like, it's a whole really... dial though, right? Yeah. Like there are, there are podcasts that are incredible that are hostless that are all, you know, curated audio. And there are four hour and episode solo shows that are absolutely incredible. And everything in between yeah right yeah. And, but, and i think for yeah. you that though i think the way that you use i don't want to say it's like a monologue but the way that you yeah. do that piece where you're talking and where yeah. it might be a little bit longer it it sets a new tone it nudges the direction of the conversation and it ups the energy every time you do it and that makes a big difference in the quality of the show overall so your guest doesn't know you yet no. and you're moving the needle to where you want it to go by doing that each episode mm -hmm. you know i'm so glad you called that out because i call it my final thought because i grew up secretly watching Jerry Springer on days when I pretended to be sick. You really uh, are like an 80s, 90s kid. Right? <laughs> yeah. And and one of my favorite things about watching the Springer show as a kid is literally the craziest, wildest stuff I could imagine would happen for about 56 minutes of TV, including commercials. Just people throwing stuff, wigs flying, elbows being thrown, women flashing the camera, just craziest stuff I could imagine. And then Jerry Springer would say at the end of this pure chaos, a very poised, put together Jerry Springer would say, everybody, I'll be back in just a second with my final thought. And then they would go to whatever commercial, they would come back and Jerry would be on a stool and he would look at the camera and you would understand how at one point he had been a mayor because he just looks at the camera and would say something wildly profound. And and I remember as a kid being like, did he just see the same episode I just saw? <laughs> like, because yeah. He made this a beautiful point about self-compassion and literally that chick just threw a turtle at that other chick. Like, what? What? And so I was worried before I knew I was going to babble the whole time on my show <laughs> uh, about how I would still have something that was mine. And I was worried because I considered myself a writer that I wouldn't have that thread of me through it. And so I thought, well, wait a minute, have a Jerry Springer final thought. I love and that. So, that's the inspiration for it. I was going to ask do. you about that. I mean, and I love that that's really what it was. <laughs> episode, every single episode of my show after the interview, which can go, you know, any number of ways, much like a Springer show, I tell everybody I'll be back in just a second with my final thought 
which is a term ripped off of Springer directly, and their homework for the week. And then I have a pre-written thing that I record, just me. Normally, it's one to three minutes. But I do that so that week to week, my listeners have a little touch point that's just me. No matter what comes up in the episode, I can make sure I deliver on my podcast promise, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. The pop culture part's been delivered. No matter what happened, though, I got to make sure that they have something to do. So that's why I give them homework week to week to week, because then I'm fulfilling that promise of action. Not only that, in the community beyond the show, then I give them something to do together. Right. I wouldn't have that if I didn't carve out that final thought. And yeah. so, you know, that's one of the things where people go, sometimes I'm just so busy and your episodes are so long, I skip right to the final thought. Is that okay? And I'm like, if you need homework that week, sure. The episodes <laughs> I love are long, that, that their know? feedback is that they're skipping to you, right? That that's well, a yeah. sign of a really great show, Annie. Mm -hmm. And you should be so proud of what you created because <sighs> I mean, I thought, I thought. When I heard that you had homework on it, I thought, what? Like, what? Mm -hmm. how would this work? And I didn't mm -hmm. think it would actually work. But it so does. Because, I mean, you're talking about, you know, not like serious, like sit down, write it. You know, like you're you're talking about mm -hmm. contemplated, make them take an action, make them do yeah. something, right? And so it's just, it, it is in that format that we're really learning from what we just did. And you help us mm -hmm. formulate that. You help us move that get it to start gelling in our thoughts over the next week, which makes us look forward to hearing you again. You created that forward bingeability, right? Like I'm not going to miss the next episode. Now you've done that. It's called open looping when you leave it that way, but in, and you open loop to something back, something forward. But in your case, you're making me desire that feeling of, I got something out of this. And now I want it again. I'm putting that in my Christmas letter this year, Tracy. I have, <laughs> I have forward into the <laughs> That's yeah. right. I love it. That's so great. Well, let's talk about the three things that, you know, everybody's always curious about. Every podcaster yeah. is struggling with these three things. We, again, matched, got on, matched on Podmatch. And I love the AI because uh -huh. they totally should have matched us together. Like, we Shout should be matched on match. every, like, match.com, right? Like, we should yes. be matched. We should be friends, right? Like, yes. And the AI seems to know that. So we're it's doing phenomenally well to put us together here. But you have a bigger process with how you manage your guests and other things like mm -hmm. that. You kind of alluded it to me earlier. So we really want to hear how that whole guesting piece works for you. How do you manage it? How do you mm -hmm. engage them? How do you get them moving forward? And how do you get great ones? So, you know, I think the thing is I show up full bore me the second that they show up on my zoom and I don't hold back. I don't, I don't want them much like I teach my because, OK, hold on. In my day job, y'all, I teach sales. I run the non sleazy Sales Academy. That's what the podcast is all for. OK, cool. We're back in. So within that day job, I am constantly making sure that my clients are not shape shifting or tone shifting in between their content, their delivery and their sales. Right. Because it's like, oh, who is this? I don't want to give my guess that whiplash where they show up in the green room and I'm either totally myself and then we start recording and I'm like thank you so much for coming today Tracy <laughs> or alternatively which I've also experienced people are like okay here we go and you're like well who is this person so I just show up like I already know everybody like I've already known everybody and I have researched them research helps because you know um it, it helps set the tone it helps ease everybody in but i just i have a spiel that i make sure i get in about what i expect and how things are going to run and things they need to know like is it swear friendly how long are we going to go all those different things but then i just sit there and i show pure actual unbridled enthusiasm that i get to pick this person's brain for free how many of us have been shamed about not asking people to pick their brains? We get it. We all have had people want to pick our brains and we're like, if there were anything left, you could pick it. But my God, I'm tired, right? However, 
when you're about to interview someone, the best thing you can do is give them the gift of enthusiasm and curiosity and attention that's real. That is regardless of your listener. If you are wrapped in attention, your guest will feel that and your audience will sense that and they'll pay closer attention. So I don't get people delivering their pat, stale, flat, whatever. So number one, my form has personality when they fill it out. Their invitation has personality when they throw it out and I'm inviting them to a pop culture show. But you can do this whether or not your show is funny or fun or not by just showing Showing that presence and that little bit of green room time you get before. But honestly, I think what makes my show different and how I've built a community around my show is I would get so freaking frustrated. Like you said, like, thank goodness Podmatch matched us. Thank goodness that AI did its job today because, you know, we finally got matched up. It drives me bonkers. And we did this in our own green room. I'm like, wait a minute. You don't know my friend Deb Eckerling? You got to get Deb Eckerling. Do you know Aaron Baker, who's this, you know, this week's TLTQ guest? You got to know Aaron Baker. Oh, my gosh, because it would make me cranky. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. We are all podcasters. We are all in the same boat together doing magnificent things. And the fact that Bestie A and Bestie B don't know each other is not okay. And so I let my guests know that they are also joining a community that's completely voluntary. It takes physical form on LinkedIn. It's called the Legitimati. Everybody's welcome to join it. But additionally, I have parties for my guests. I am constantly introducing my guests to other guests. I do a lot of guesting myself. I do a lot of pod swaps. That's all community building based on, again, my unbridled enthusiasm and curiosity about the gift of the brain that I am receiving. As long as you don't hold back on showing that appreciation, the community can't help but form around your show. And all you have to do is go, oh, wait, I got to send an email here. Or, oh, wait, let me tag two people on this post. Right, exactly. And, And by doing that, though, you've created this, the guest must share. They mm-hmm. they feel so good coming out of your interview that they yep. can't help but share that episode. And that's mm-hmm. really where I think it goes really wrong for a lot of podcasters that they, they don't get the share quality from the guest. Mm-hmm. And it really was that they weren't invested in the moment of the show mm-hmm. itself. You know, and also totally true. And and I'm guilty of this too. If I have a super shiny interviewer, a less shiny interviewer, one where I felt like, you know, the host and I were long lost cousins or something, I'm I'm gonna put more stank on that episode on social because it means more to me, right? That's just true. But I think another thing, if we're talking about shareability, uh, which is really counterintuitive about podcasting, is there's a lot of pressure on landing big names on your show, the celebrity guest. And I've had some celebrity guests, and it has been a delight to interview my celebrity guests. Did I get a big bump in listenership because of my celebrity guests? Listen in, listeners. The answer is hell no. Why? (laughs) Because they don't need my show. They're celebrity guests. They're busy. They're on a million shows. Their listeners chime in no matter what they do. They could read a cereal box and their people would love them. So do they try? Mm, No. Nice for name recognition? Sure. Nice for going out and getting other big fish when you can be like, hey, I had your fancy pants friend on. Maybe you should come too? Sure. However... I call this the assistant principal effect. If you go after the principal of a school because you're trying to sell the school, that principal is busy and that principal does not need you. The vice principal has something to prove. The vice principal gets none of the glory and most of the work. Why are you not putting the vice principals on your show? If people come to me and they say, my list is small or my business is new, I say, okay, well, what do you have to share? I don't even ask them how they're going to share the show. I say, what do you in your brain have to share that my listeners need to know? What is your perspective, your vantage point? I have people apologize to me for the size of their Instagram when applying to be on my show. No, y'all. No. And I hear people all the time. Oh, I can't have so-and-so because they're not a name. Well, then help them become a name. Get a buddy in the game and also give them great content to share because they're hungry for 
it. I have the podcasting stats to prove that you can bring a person with no list on your show. And if they show up in full heart, you will have multiples, multiples of the number of listens on your celebrity guests because you believe in them on their way up not you're showcasing someone that's already in the spotlight. I'm telling you all, don't sleep on the smallest people. They have just as much to say, if not more so. They are unsung heroes. They will be grateful and damn it, will they get in there and share. They will work their butts off. Oh, Annie, I I could just come through the screen right now and kiss you because I'm so tired of being the broken record and saying this to people. Yes, I I tell this. I tell the John Travolta story like this is because that was my celebrity. Mm -hmm. And I tell the story about how bad it was and everything like that. Uh, You know, it (sighs) it was a bad interview was bad sharing, like everything about it was it. But it's the same thing. Yes, you are so, so right on this. And this is I, you know, my goal in and with some of the things that we been doing is to really make sure that the podcasters that I have on the binge factor are committed to podcasting, Mm -hmm. not have the super high listens because the ones that don't have the super high listens are the ones we learn the most from because they're working their butts (laughs) off on it. Right? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I'm not knocking anybody in the top 5%, but they got there by doing all the hard work to get there. Right. And now they don't talk about it. Right. Like, And now it's just built in. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the same thing I'm, from the guesting side. I've experienced the same thing. Number one, I've had people tell me that my list is not big enough to be on their show or want to charge me, you know, four figures, five figures to be on their show. And, and my response to both of those things is. <laughs> no. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, no. Right. But I've also been on some super big shows that are in the top 1%, 0.5%, 0.05% podcast as a guest. And I've delivered great content on those shows. I've also delivered great content on shows that don't even rank on podcastings yet. I've been interview number one for people. Guess where I made more money? Again, I have the receipts for this. Big show, I expected to make a zillion dollars. Did I? No, I didn't. Little show, I expected to maybe get a handful of listens, didn't really expect any clients. Did I get clients from that? Heck yes. Why? Again, partnership with the host or partnership with the guest and showing someone that you don't care if they're a big fish, they're a big fish to you. Mm, So, so smart. Well, let's talk about listeners. Yeah. You, You know, listener growth, I think it's every podcaster's biggest dream. (laughs) Like they all want more listeners. And you know, that's, that's partially true. I would like more of the right listeners, but you know, (laughs) still more listeners. So what do you feel like you're doing that's working? And what are you thinking about trying next? I love the next, right? I, I always want next, 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 next. So one thing that I think that I'm doing right is providing the homework. Uh, It's one thing for me to take an hour of someone's time to make them laugh while they do dishes. But at the end of the day, one thing I think I do well, which leads into clients in the long term, but listeners in the short term, is I do provide that actionable, tangible takeaway that grounds my show week after week. And I'm very painstaking on what that is. Sometimes it's a soft skill. Sometimes it's a hard skill. Sometimes it's fill out a worksheet. Sometimes it's attend a thing, right? Whatever it may be. But if it's not going to move the needle at least an inch, it doesn't go into the homework, right? So week after week, the listeners know I am overwhelmed. I'm stressed. I'm a small business owner. I have too much on my plate. What the heck am I going to do to move the needle this week? Oh, Annie will tell me what to do. I got three minutes. At least I can get my three minutes at the end of the episode if I can't listen to the whole hour. Or if I don't like the pop culture thing, you might get the whole hour. That's the other thing on listeners that I think I'm doing right. By having an expert, that's one touch point that might bring them in. By having that expert's expertise, their topic, their content, their thought leadership, that's another possible lure. And then by having the pop culture piece, that's another possible lure. Right. So using this week episode as an example, I'm interviewing Dr. Aaron Baker. They themselves may be a perfect lure. I love Aaron. Their brain is magnificent. Maybe someone groupies of Aaron will, you know, run on in. 
number one. Aaron just wrote a book about joy and how joy is actually an extremely necessary, profitable business engine. If I'm curious about that, I may come in on the idea of joy. But then we also talk about a league of their own. So if I'm in a league of their own movie or series, right, then I may come in that way. However, I understand that not any of those week to week may be for all listeners. So the other thing that I have done to make sure that binging, because we're on the binge factor, happens is I don't see a lot of sequential binges on my show. I don't see a lot of, I listen to episode 91, the 92, the 93, the 94, the 95. I see lots of cousins and grouping. So one thing that I do is I provide my listeners with playlists. So for example, if you are looking at this week's episode, again, League of Their Own episode, League of Their Own was a major movie in the 1990s. So that episode is on my legitimate 90s playlist. In my show notes, it says this is part of the legitimate 90s playlist. And if you go to the legitimate 90s playlist, you're going to see a whole bunch of other 90s movies, TV and music right there that you can choose from why you're more likely to binge if I'm meeting you where you are. Now, on the flip side of that, I also have legitimate selling, legitimate social media, right? So if you're hungry for social media content and only social media based content, you can also go over there and get your actionable needs met. So I think one of the things I would implore you all to do is have fun with the exploration with asking yourself the question, how will your show be binged? Because there are ways other than just episode, 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 episode binge. That's so, so true. I'm really glad you said that because I think that that is the next, right? For a lot of people as they mm -hmm. hit a hundred, that's mm -hmm. the perfect time because it's too many at that point yeah. for people to scroll through. Yep. It's the perfect time to start playlisting your shows or grouping them together. Yep. Um, you know, frankly, it's why we, we built our showcast player. We have a showcaster player. We built it for playlists in mind because this is so critically important to get people moving through the episodes yes. that are going to be most beneficial to them. Yes. And it's the one that will make them stick around and listen to the new episodes when they come out. Yes. So now I have the playlist and what I'm excited for next is to rock those playlists even more. That's great. So you're, you're thinking maybe about finding guests to add to these playlists and yeah! finding topics that you can talk about that are going to build on them. Right. Or, you know, going out and doing social listening on those things. If I'm out with my, I was listening to your show. I didn't even know that Bippity Boppity Business existed. And oh now my gosh, I'm that like, is a fun one. <laughs> why, why, why is that person? Why are we not best friends? A, B, how did this podcast sneak past me? C, why hasn't she been a guest on TLTQ? And also, why isn't she sponsoring the legitimate Disney playlist? She has a business Disney playlist podcast i have a legitimate disney playlist why are these there things should not be touching? cross pollination yes right so awesome. that's the thing is like now i can look at building ecosystems around those playlists now that i have those playlists that, that's so so great you know i think that also the homework that you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that we're having mm -hmm. about the listener growth the homework is a really interesting way to keep listeners. And this is as important, I think, for everyone to think about is that the reason we want a bingeable show is because we keep our listeners, because the more they we get in their ear, the more they're like, what is she going to say next? And what's the next one going to be about? And I don't want to miss it. So it's mm -hmm. about them then sticking on to listen to the new things as they come out. Mm -hmm. And when they listen to the new, they don't, it's not they're not picky about it because they have no idea what they're getting into when they listen to it. It's not like, right. So yeah. then they really are listening through to figure out what's going on. But that, that homework is a bug in their ear. So even if they don't do the homework, mm -hmm. they've got this, like I was assigned homework and I should be thinking about this. I should yep. be doing this. And you are still in their mind throughout the week till they hit the next episode going, dropping. You know, it's really that's, terrible. I think really important. You uh -huh. are bringing them through just from that, inviting them to that next episode. One of the best pieces of show mail I ever got. It made me feel like a little demon for like three days. I was like, hee, hee, hee. somebody sent me an email and I have this little box that says, uh, 
evidence to the contrary for imposter syndrome, right? So I print out <laughs> these things or I put my little cards in there, right? Because everybody has bad days. But I put this little note, I actually printed it out and put it in there and it said, hi, Annie, I just want to let you know, I just paid $495 for a one-on-one -on -one session with a coach. And she told me to do last week's TLTQ homework as the big payoff of the episode. So thanks for <laughs> literally giving me for free something I just paid $500 for. And I was like, oh, that's terrible and awesome. And like, awesome, oh, right? Oh. Right. And so I put it in the next step. And I'd mentioned it in the next episode. I was like, hey, y'all, apparently last week's homework was worth $500, $495 to be exact. Like, get after it. If you didn't do last week's homework, people are charging for this information. And I was like, oh, that's terrible. And I'm not trying to take money out of anybody's pocket, but it is a really tangible way to provide value for people whose shows are supposed to motivate and inspire action. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Your true crime podcast is probably not going to have homework. Right. Maybe activism homework, which would be great and I would love to see, right? But they're not going to be like, go out and try to poison someone today. <laughs> but <don't>. <laughs> if you're a parenting podcast, a lifestyle podcast, a cooking podcast, a relationship podcast, a psychology podcast, a business podcast, give them some homework. Come on. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, let's talk monetization because, you cool. know podcasting, like everybody's always concerned about that, but yeah. I guarantee there's lots of alternative or what I'm going to say is like, you know, wonderful, um, fringe <laughs> opportunities that have come yeah. your way and other things that have happened to you because of your podcast. So what's mm -hmm. been the clearest monetization for you and what do you want to see more of relationship-based affiliates? Mm. Boom. And if y'all have been listening to this episode, that shouldn't surprise you. I treat my guests like family. My guests become my family. If I'm on their show, I make sure I love them up and share it a ton, right? And so I make any money from my podcast. I do no advertising. My show isn't big enough yet. It's rapidly growing, but advertisers, serious advertisers, want that big money, want that big list. And my show is still growing. We're less than two years old, right? So we're currently sitting right in the top 2%. So we have some room to grow still. And yet, I'm not hurting because my BFFs that become my BFFs on live mic while I'm interviewing them, not in the green room, not in an email before, not in the follow-up after, literally becoming my best friends on the mic, get me, understand me, and I make sure that in the moments following, we understand how we can mutually support each other. And so I get a lot of referred business from my guests. And that has been a phenomenal revenue stream for my business. Now, I have also gotten a handful of clients directly from my show, but let me tell you where I went really, really wrong on that. Because I did. Because I did. Sometimes if you have a business show or if you have a show that is related to your business, your show doesn't quite match your business, right? So the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy and Too Legitimate to Quit are buddies. They're not twins. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Right? And so because I am an onion and I like to talk about things other than just selling, which is my bread and butter and what I talk about on other people's shows, except this wonderful show who lets me talk about other things. Thank you, Tracy. Right. But what I didn't do well was explain the gap between the NSSA and TLTQ and how they're both me. And if you want access to me, then you can go into the next step in my action item, right? right? I didn't want it to be the Annie P. Ruggles show. I was really big on that. However, I'm trying to get people to pay me. And it's right after my final thought where they just had unadulterated me. So maybe I should have owned that a bit more. And now I do, number one. So do not hide in your call to action if you're trying to monetize. Drive them to you, not another collaborative project if you're doing an interview show, number one. And number two, what call to action, people, please. Yes. I did this so 
badly. If you go back into my original episodes where the ending hasn't been replaced with a more current ending, if you go back there, it's like, hey, thanks so much for listening. Here's 45,000 things you could possibly do. Every funnel I've ever done and 17 other interviews you can listen to. And, it was and don't like, forget to rate and review. <laughs> and don't forget to rate and review. And it's like, oh, homies, no. Right? So, y'all, if you want to monetize, what is the next action you want your listeners to take one action one okay i just got them to listen they just did their homework now what do i want them to do i want them to go join the legitimati and post their homework okay legitimati that is Ready? one of my favorite terms by the way i'm so glad we got Thank to that because i wanted like everyone wanted everybody to hear that it's one of right? my favorite terms yeah. but one show one call to action one place where I can have that centralized thing. Now, is legit is them joining Legitimati going to make me money immediately? No, it's a longer term funnel, right? But is coming into a LinkedIn group where everyone is constantly being like, oh my God, Annie, this episode is amazing. And I'm so glad I did my homework. It made me $500. Yeah, that's going to bring me in some business indirectly. So there are longer term goals like building that ecosystem around your show, which you can monetize. There are also the shorter term goals, the people that will bring you money quickly. Those are your affiliates. And guess what? They're probably your guests. Absolutely. Well, Annie, I, do, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, and I'm so glad you gave us a takeaway about the calls to action, but mm -hmm. I mean, non-sleazy sales academy. I love the synergistic sales communication messaging that you talk about. What other types of things do you really think from the business side of what you do mm -hmm. that us podcasters should utilize? From the business side of things, what should podcasters utilize? I touched on it before, but let me reiterate it because it really is that important. If you are just, okay, well, hold on. It's actually two steps. Number one, if you are not using podcasting to network, you are missing the joy of podcasting. Boom, period, done. <laughs> like, that's it, okay? But that being said, if you are using podcasting to network, but you are not using that network to build an ecosystem involving your other people's favorite brains and not just your brain, you are missing out. This happens on a daily basis in my world now, and it even delights me equally or more than my show when I see two people who didn't know each other who are highly complimentary serve each other either as partners as contractors as new friends as support sisters as whatever right why a I'm a pre people people I love when my people love my people it makes me feel good I'm an only child I love to be surrounded in love right I, I don't know maybe it's a childhood thing but Every single time one of those people has a touch point with that other person, even if it's subconscious, my name comes back up to the surface. As a connector, as someone in the know, as a generous person, as a person who is willing to go to the extra mile to make sure they got their next opportunity. So what you should be doing, y'all, is after you interview everyone, introduce if they were exceptional and most of your interviewers will be if you show up ex exceptionally most of your guests will rise to that occasion you set the bar at the end of every single episode i want you asking your guests what other kind of shows they want to be on you know that and then you can make an introduction i make introductions constantly and the same thing i said it to you in pre-chat before we even recorded it i'm like i know podcast hosts that are incredible who do you want when i'm a guest i ask the same question in reverse who do you want on this show who do you need i have a whole list of people in my head just waiting for tracy and guess what those people rely on me because they know that without second thought or even a prayer of monetization that i'm going to get you and them connected how is that going to turn into immediate money for me? Who knows? Let's find out. But what it does turn into is a lot of gratitude and gratitude you can take to the bank. Ugh. Drop the mic right there, Annie. That was just perfect and such a great takeaway. Homework. <laughs> Let's go build our networks, right, everyone? Let's thinking about how you can use your show to create that community. Heck yeah. 
Well, Annie, thank you so much. Too legitimate to quit a show not to be missed. Oh, what an endorsement. Thank you so much for having me, Tracy. I love this model of a business show disguised as a talk show, as a, as a gossip show. And that's kind of what our show is like. It's just got a lot of fun injected in it in all the right places. And but some great actionable items that come out of it in the end. It's just really fascinating to see this model work so well. And uh, I mean, a lot of this is Annie. She just pulls this off in just such a great way. It's what she's interested in. It's what she's excited about. It's the, the, the uniqueness she brings to her podcast in such a great way. So I just think that this is um, a model that can't be pulled off by everyone. But there are some of you out there who really could pull off something very unique to you and take a note from Annie P. Ruggles and the Too Legitimate to Quit podcast. Plus, there's just lots of great tips and, and, and talks and all kinds of things that she just gave you in that episode that you might want to go to the blog post for this episode and make your notes. I look forward to having you listen to Annie P. Ruggles and check out her show and take some actionable items and put it into your plan for your podcast. And I will be back next week with another great podcast host here on The Binge Factor to give you just another perspective on podcasting. You've been listening to The Binge Factor Podcast. For more information on podcasting and video casting success tips and tactics, please go to thebingefactor.com. And be sure to listen to our other show for podcasters called Feed Your Brand. If you'd like to be interviewed on this show, as well as featured in Tracy's column, please go to thebingefactor.com slash guest and apply. 